One of the biggest criticisms I've received over my years of science writing is that I'm supporting a flawed model, otherwise known as Western medicine. And indeed, it is. Our current science is not perfect. But what usually follows that criticism is that there are ancient natural healing remedies that we should be relying on. And that's equally problematic. Many people romanticize the past, this notion that the secrets to optimal health and longevity rely on so-called natural medicines. It was this psychological quirk that Chairman Mao exploited when he boosted, you can even say created, the concept of traditional Chinese medicine in the 1950s. For this segment, I'm going to focus on one particularly insidious TCM cure that's collapsing an entire ecosystem in Baja, California. But let me provide a little context first. The romanticized version of TCM is that it's an ancient system that has made a giant impact in the West, particularly in naturopathy and acupuncture, along with practices like cupping, gua sha, and herbal treatments. But just as the asanas you're doing in your local studio, or more likely on Zoom right now, whose postures are not thousands of years old, but really just over a hundred, TCM was first introduced as a concept in the English language, not Mandarin. And the larger framework was a nationalist plot by Chairman Mao in the 1950s. I want to thank Alan Levinovitz for this part of the reporting, whose article is linked to in the show notes. So... Yes, medicine is ancient in China, just like it is around the world. There was not a comprehensive system, however. The Compendium of Materia Medica was written in the 16th century, and the author is said to have read 800 textbooks in compiling his massive work, so he's really the first to systematize a wide variety of practices, just as the Hippocratic Corpus systematized Greek medicine roughly 2,300 years ago. Mao's desire to unify Chinese medicine with Western medicine pushed TCM to the forefront. That doesn't mean he was a fan. In fact, he once said, even though I believe we should promote Chinese medicine, personally, I do not believe in it. I don't take Chinese medicine. So he didn't see it as a method of healing, but a political opportunity. In 1952, the president of the Chinese Medical Association followed this up when saying, This one medicine will possess a basis in modern natural sciences, will have absorbed the ancient and the new, the Chinese and the foreign, all medical achievements, and will be China's new medicine! Exclamation point. And so traditional Chinese medicine is propaganda spread out over the world. I understand that America is going through an identity crisis right now, and that, in fact, much of that self-reflection is healthy in terms of grappling with racism, misogyny, and xenophobia. But we have to criticize dangerous systems. And given issues in online security, human cloning, and AI in China right now, let's remember this country's government has been a propaganda machine for many decades. Now, does this mean that no TCM treatments work? Of course not. But it's filled with pseudoscience, and as I'll get to shortly, these unproven and at times dangerous concoctions are affecting numerous ecosystems across the planet. Why would people in America fall for a medical ideology that believes that bear testicles and tiger penises are potent aphrodisiacs and crocodile meat improves memory? or that those illegally traded cobras being served improves your eyesight. Levinovitz explains, The reason so many people take Chinese medicine seriously, at least in part, is that it was reinvented by one of the most powerful propaganda machines of all time, and then consciously marketed to a West disillusioned by its own spiritual traditions. And he's right, we're suffering from severe distrust of our institutions right now in many cases, deservedly so. But when you turn to another untrustworthy institution for an answer, you're ultimately going to be disappointed. For example, in the fall, I was on Parler to track some of the figures we cover on this podcast. 
Now that the app is hosted on Russian servers, I have no intention of providing them with my information. Russia isn't exactly a haven for free speech, and you have to wonder why this particular hosting company was so willing to take on such a toxic media if it didn't have a stake in what's being shared, or of sharing messages they want Americans to hear. Nations don't just collapse unless there's both internal and external pressure. Ecosystems also just don't collapse, and I don't think humans realize our role in the many environments we're destroying right now. A recent review in the journal Science found that humans are devastating ocean ecosystems at an alarming rate. And the culprit? Anthropogenic noise. Our ocean trawlers, the practice of dynamite fishing, recreational speedboats, and so much more decimating entire populations of sharks, whales, fish, plankton, coral reefs, all because we're just too damn noisy. Speaking of noise, Chairman Mao was an expert. In the push for Chinese expansion, he never worried about environmental impact. Think about this the next time you purchase a natural remedy marketing under this propaganda regime. The global population of tigers has been reduced by 95% due to illegal trading, much of it going into, you guessed it, traditional Chinese medicine. Environmental impact is what inspired this segment. It's very hard to listen to wellness influencers discussing their organic diets and holistic lifestyle when actual consideration of the environments means abandoning traditional Chinese medicine. Not the parts that don't work, but all of it. And I came to this realization when watching the National Geographic documentary, Sea of Shadows, in 2019. The director, Richard Lacani, decided to use his filmmaking skills for environmental justice after following Jane Goodall around the world, which resulted in the film Jane's Journey. She inspired Richard to look at the environment and its interconnected systems in a different light. He has since dedicated his career to making movies with a purpose. Richard's next film brought him to Africa, where he went undercover to track the illegal poaching of elephants. Middle-class Chinese prize ivory as a status symbol, and bandits were more than happy to supply it. And thanks to his film, The Ivory Game, the poachers were sentenced to 12 years in prison, and the Chinese government began enforcing laws against the trade of ivory. And that film was produced by Leonardo DiCaprio, who then called Richard to document the Tatuaba trade in the Sea of Cortez. This region, which connects Baja California with mainland Mexico, is being overrun by the Mexican cartels and Chinese mafia, who are working together to kill Totuaba for their bladders, which in TCM is believed to cure arthritis, a completely unproven claim. The Sea of Cortez is the only place in the world that Totoaba live, and their population is being decimated by Mexican fishermen working for the cartels and the mafia. Now, even worse, vaquitas, the world's smallest whales, are also being destroyed. At the time of filming, there were maybe 40 left in the wild. I had the chance to talk to Richard shortly after the film came out, and I asked him if the entire ecosystem will become infertile if this trade continues. Well, absolutely. If the vaquita goes extinct, which we're trying everything um, you know, in our power with the impact of film and so forth, for that not to happen, but if it happens, it will mean that the cartel is going to completely take over the area because the attention, the focus, the spotlight that it has right now because of the vaquita, because it is such a symbolic animal and it's been, you know, highly exposed now what's going on and the Mexicans are aware of this. If the vaquita goes extinct, what will happen is the NGOs will be removed from the area. They will just move on to a new war somewhere, some conflict, maybe in Peru or South Africa or who knows. The, they are going to pull out, you know, the Mexican Navy, the warships, because they will be like, well, it's too late now. They, you know, it went extinct. And what will happen is the cartel is going to 100% take over the Sea of Cortez. All the fishermen are going to be pressured to go out for the Totoaba. And you've seen how they do it. They drop thousands of gill nets, walls of death, kill everything just to get to that one last and final Totoaba. You know, and they will kill everything in its path. All the whales, the sharks, the dolphins, the turtles, everything will disappear just because they're going for that Totoaba. And until that last Totoaba is dead and they have sold it to the Chinese, that war will continue and it will completely destroy 
the future of these fishermen, the fishing grounds for the next decades of fishermen, there will be nothing left and it will be a dead sea, a sea of death. Again, remember, this is all thanks to lucrative smuggling due to traditional Chinese medicine. I then asked Richard if he conducted any research on this area of medicine in China. We did a lot of research and we even filmed in China for a month. Um, the reason we didn't include that in the film was because we realized that there was no demand for us in, like, there, we didn't have an ask of the Chinese government because it was already illegal to um, trade Totoaba. And the, we did find out, everyone we talked to, every scientist we talked to said to us, it's not proven, Western science, right? There's, they couldn't find any proof that it has any medicinal power at all. But three, we realized that it would need a whole generation for a campaign to change the minds of the, of the Chinese. And the vaquita maybe has 12 months left. It will never be solved in China. There is nothing we can do in China that will stop this trade in time because this is driven by the Chinese mafia and the cartels. They're pushing it out. They are going to always push out the message that, yes, it works. Chinese traditional medicine is the only medicine that works. And... Of course, this is, you know, highly prized, valuable medicine. And it will, it will take like a decade or two decades to actually maybe have an impact and change the mind of the Chinese people. Now, I can't recommend this film enough, but seeing the violence around this trade, the real human cost, is an eye-opener. In one harrowing scene, Richard and his team were being fired at by the Mexican cartel for filming their activities, which he described to me in detail. We were running, uh, we were hiding behind cars and everything. So I, I knew what was, what was happening, but it was, you know, there was fear, but there was also control in the way of like, okay, now stay focused, watch those rocks coming. It got even more and more like what scared me the most was that when shots started to appear, like we were hearing gunfire, I was like, oh shit, I don't know who's shooting at who because we weren't able to see. Is it the cartel now opening fire on us? Is it the Navy shooting at them or in the air? And the one moment that I thought, okay, now we are really in the shit is when I heard bullets ricocheting off walls around us because that meant that they are firing not in the air, but actually at us. Just got worse for us after that. I mean, there's stuff that is, you know, not in the film when we got threatened by the cartel right after because they then, they had exposed our identities. I mean, we were, they had seen us, photographed us, then they followed us home. And then we got direct threats from Oscar Parra singling us out. And actually, he requested a meeting with me um, that the following night. And I had to come alone and... It was, uh, I was like, why? And he's like, well, he wants to talk to you and you can talk to him as well. And I was just like, no, I don't, I don't think so. And, you know, they sent guys to our house and it was very, very threatening. And that's when we knew we had to get out of there. I mean, that was like three weeks after he had shot that soldier in the street. So we knew he was a brutal murderer. Fishermen who resisted the demands of the mob either went broke or, as happened while making this film, were killed. Also, people half a world away could pay exorbitant prices for a medicine that isn't actually a medicine. Elephants, bears, tigers, oh my. And those aren't the only animals suffering population collapse for pseudoscience. Every ecosystem is a delicate balance of forces. When you destroy one animal, others suffer or overpopulate and thrive until, as humans are showing right now, they destroy everything around them. While I'm all for alleviating human suffering, we don't seem particularly adept at recognizing our environmental impact. The cognitive dissonance between what we think we are and what we really are, it can be, and often is, murderous. And unfortunately, pseudoscience is the primary language of conspiritualists, a sort of Esperanto for wellness influencers in their downlines. Traditional Chinese medicine is thriving during this pandemic. And wouldn't you know it, China's state-controlled media, run by President Xi, is continuing what Mao started 70 years ago. The dissemination of misinformation and pseudoscience for profit and power. 
And it seems that the conspiritualists who spend so much time railing against the secret cabal of big pharma and their insidious vaccines don't even realize they're being played. The exact criticism they level against the sheeple who are just trying to survive a confusing time by following public health guidelines. But let's be honest, it was never about the environment. And it's definitely never been about science. If it was, then TCM advocates would recognize that if acupuncture has healing properties, it's thanks to the adenosine rushing to the area of insult in the body, not vital energies like heat wind that's supposed to alleviate COVID. And you know what? That's okay. That's what science does. It looks for evidence. If down the road we discover that heat wind really does treat a dangerous virus, let's use it. But right now, there's no sign of such a thing. And yet still, people in Canada are paying $50 a box for cheap, unproven, traditional Chinese medicine. And that's nothing compared to what the vaquitas and totoabas and tigers and elephants and bears and ants, yeah, they're in there too, what they have endured in our quest for optimal health. We want eternal youth and perpetual virility, and the price is their lives. And I get it. Put on your oxygen mask first. But when you suck all the oxygen out of the world, pretty soon you're going to find your own supply dwindling as well.